Welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly show in which generally I have a convert or a revert to the Catholic faith, except on an open line first Friday when I invite in someone to answer any question you might pose about The Journey Home. Well, this is not first Friday, and Father Mitch Pacwa is no convert either, but he's someone that you're very familiar with. Any of you of the EWTN family are well aware of Father Mitch, and I must say that one of the main reasons that I've invited him to be on this show is because the impact that he has had through his television appearances, his books, his debates on tape, and other resources that have so influenced so many on the return to the Catholic Church. Father Mitch, hey, a nice great to privilege to have you with us. Same here, Marcus. Great to see you again. Now, I think the first time that I saw you was when I was a Protestant pastor surfing through the channels on my cable and would run across EWTN, and usually I wouldn't stay all that long because at that point the Catholic Church wasn't even an issue. Sure. But I remember seeing, uh, of course, Mother yeah. and Ben Urkashel and you. Now, how yeah. long have you been with the network? 14 years. 14 I started years? In 14 years. started in 1984. I love saying how uh, my first show was February 29th, 1984, uh, Sadie Hawkins Day. And I always <laughs> tell Mother that uh, this is uh, obviously her Sadie Hawkins Day date. So <laughs> she said to me once, yeah, you must have been pretty hard up, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to find a date after 30 years. 84. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Boy, that, I, for me, that was, I'd only been ordained a, a pastor a year when you were on here, and I, Catholic Church wasn't even an issue yeah. for me at that point. You've been with so many programs on this network, I'm wondering if we're going to talk about converts and conversions mm -hmm. tonight, and uh, we don't look at converts as scalps on our belts by any means. No. It's, it's a, a great privilege that God gives us uh, to be used as a vessel, as a channel, and so, thank God for those opportunities. I'm specifically wondering at this point, in relationship to your programs on EWTN, have you had responses from people who, because of your programs on this network, that have brought them back to the church? Yeah, a number of times. Uh, for instance, one pastor told me how he would watch my shows again and again to help him prepare his sermons. You know, a lot of Protestant <laughs> churches have you know, a little more freedom in the lectionary. And that they, uh, because of my programs on the prophets, I was following, you know, a prophetic book all the way through. He would do that with his sermons. <laughs> <laughs> and he said it really helped him to prepare the sermons, but it also got him interested in seeing that the Catholics have a perspective on the prophets that is not just end times perspective, mm -hmm. um, though it doesn't exclude, you know, dealing with that. But, uh, and it's not just social justice, mm -hmm. that, uh, is, but it doesn't exclude that either, but rather can take a look at a variety of issues in the prophets when they criticize Israel for the uh, sins against God by idolatry and, and mm -hmm. the occult and what we would now call New Age, uh, when they criticize Israel for social injustice, and when they uh, would prophesy mm -hmm. the coming Messiah, and when they would call Israel to be its best and to its future glory. Mm. You know, that we have that sense of being able to take a look at the whole. Um, you know, I went to uh, seminary. That's something, too. I don't know if you knew this. But uh, when I uh, studied Greek and Hebrew and got my doctorate, I did it in Protestant institutions. That's right. I remember I, that. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. A, I remember when I first heard that. I thought, is that right? Yeah, I studied uh, first. Uh, my first courses in Greek and Hebrew were at a Lutheran uh, theological seminary. And then my second courses were at a Presbyterian seminary in mm -hmm. Chicago, McCormick. Mm -hmm. And then I got my doctorate from Vanderbilt, which is a Methodist school. And I loved it. You know, mm -hmm. it was a wonderful place to be uh, because I learned so much. Uh, you know, Hebrew and Greek grammar, this isn't denominational. Right. And, you know, I could study, you know, good literature and things. And every so often I'd get a little bit of grief here and there, but it wasn't, it wasn't. <laughs> You know, ill-mannered by any means, and the people. I was a curiosity to a lot of you know. Is this Catholic? And he's reading the Bible, and See, doing I, a doctorate in it. I think that's why, though, that so many have been uh, open to what you have to say, especially when I look at Protestant clergy, to what you have to write or say mm. because of your commitment to uh, interpreting from the Greek and the Hebrew. Right. 
which that's what we studied when we were in seminary. Sure, sure. Right, and so there's a, a connection there um, with your commitment on the one hand to scripture, but not scripture alone. Right, right. right, right. <laughs> and I, I think that's something we'll talk about a little, a little later because uh, in some sense this whole idea of scripture alone almost gets ludicrous when you have to interpret some of these Old Testament stories and statements. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Sure. Your, your work with converts, you had a big influence in my own conversion. Uh -huh. Again, I'm not sure if you remember our incident when we had on the phone. We talked yes. a little bit about yes, that earlier. Remember. But that was an important conversation for me. And I can't remember why someone gave me your name or even why I had enough gumption to give you a call. Yeah. But it was in a very important part for me when I, on the one hand, was convicted about the reality of the Catholic Church. But on the other hand, what am I going to do? And that issue is so common amongst clergy sure. converts today. That's right. That's What's right. been your experience with men like this who've had to deal with this issue? First of all, um, I am very, very strong in having respect for the problem and that it's not you know, a simplistic response from me that's going to help and say, well, just, just do this. Um, <laughs> you know, you, that we do have to deal very seriously with the um, uh, question of how will you eat? You've got a responsibility right. to children and to a wife sometimes, you know, the, the, the various cases. Um, sometimes wives work, sometimes they don't have another job. How are you going to eat? Where are you going to live? Mm -hmm. And these are serious concerns. Your ministry to your children is an important ministry. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to take that seriously and at the same time not uh, as you will remember, mo Molly coddled the issue. <laughs> I'm not known to be that way. Uh, I don't know if, if I mentioned what, what I said. That, you, know, that we, you said, I believe in the Catholic Church, but do you think I can do more good where I'm at? And I said, no, because you're not following your conscience. Yeah. You know, and that God respects your conscience, and I respect your conscience. You have to do the same. Yeah. You know, and make, you've made a decision. You have to act on that decision. At the same time, you know, I do respect other people's conscience. I don't say that, well, even if you don't believe in the Catholic Church, you better join or else you're going to hell. That, that's absurd. That's <laughs> right. patently absurd. The issue it's good is, that you said that because yeah. many believe that that's exactly what the Catholic Church would mm, teach. No, and it, it's, it, it, you know, as a matter of fact, if you went against your conscience to become a Catholic, say you did it uh, for the money, uh, mm. I don't know where you'd find that. <laughs> uh, if you did it because you win big prizes, you know, that's ridiculous, you know, yeah. that would be sinful. Uh, you have to do this because it's true. That's why we can't give communion out to anybody. You know, we can't just sort of say, oh, let's hand it out. It's not a party favor. That, you know, you have to have your conscience formed and a commitment made to this. And, and then if you do, then you have obligations as well. You know, I remember that conversation. And the, and the way I remember it was, on my side, struggling with making this decision, which I knew would mean uh, abandoning my vocation, you know, abandoning the way that I support my family, all those issues. Plus, we wonder whether the friends would ever speak to us again and family sure. and all those issues. Sure. But I remember talking to you, can I stay a Presbyterian pastor? And it was kind of like, oh, sure, if you can. <laughs> and I remember it was almost like it freed me up to really look square at the issue yeah. of going against my conscience. Yeah. Yeah. You freed me up to be able to look square at it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If I could, sure. Uh -huh. But I couldn't. Yeah. Because conscience was so... Uh, and in some sense, that's what brought me into the church was the issue of truth and authority mm -hmm. and being submissive to the truth and authority and there's in the church. And that's, for me, that was one of the issues that drew me to the Catholic Church. From your work with others that have converted, mm -hmm. on the one hand, what have you seen as maybe the big issues that open up people's hearts to the truth of the Catholic Church? And maybe another, and we'll talk about those that stand in the way, but first the... Yeah, the things that um, help people to enter the faith is, first of all, um, they see that more parts fit together. Mm -hmm. That, uh, for instance, in Scripture, you know, we don't have to you know, hide away or put away the, the texts that deal with the importance of doing works yeah. and that you'll be judged if you're not loving. Nor do we hide or put away uh, from ourselves the importance of faith. Mm -hmm. you know that it's not faith or works that say you, it's this whole reality. Mm -hmm. And the parts fit more together. Mm -hmm. 
and, and, the, and typically, you know, when you uh, it depends on whom you're talking to. Uh, some people are living very sinful lives. Then, the good morality and the true morals helps them to see, I don't have to stay stuck in this rut that is deadly. Someone who is addicted to you know, gambling, to sexual sin, or something that you know, they, they just can't get out of that rut. And they find that there's a way, not merely to blame your parents or to justify yourself, but to find Christ's strength and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the sacrament of confession, uh, for instance, is not just there for the priests to get all the dirt on everybody, uh, as a matter of fact, as you well know, when I hear a confession, say you were to come to confession to me, I can't even talk to you about it again. It's done as far as that goes. Um, the issue is that Christ gives the grace to, for to forgive you and strengthen you. When the sinner finds that, the, 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 there's this relief, hmm. you know, and that they don't need psychotherapy, well, they might, but they don't need it to blame somebody else for what they do wrong. They take their own responsibility. Whereas for so many of the Protestants I know who become Catholics, they're often such wonderful pe folks already. Right. And you know, it's not a matter of converting from major patterns of sin or something, but it's that what they're already doing, they're already living good lives, but they didn't know quite how to put that into a theological system. You know, if, if, it's, if I'm just right by faith alone, well, I'm, I'm doing all these good works here, but you know, does it matter? And, and we, they find a way to say, yeah, this, this fits better. Mm -hmm. and, and, there, there's, and it opens up a little more room for them um, that, to, 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 to understand their own experience. Uh, I, I love the way you put that because in the work that I do in the Coming Home Network where I'm often contacted by, let's say, a Protestant clergyman or, or layman who's on the journey, I sometimes almost get more excited not so much about them becoming Catholic, but about them seeing this big picture mm -hmm. of the truth, mm -hmm. the fullness mm -hmm. of the truth. Mm -hmm. Because previously, when you are kind of a Bible alone, and you've, you've found your three or four verses that are your key verses, and you kind of set it in this direction, you spend a lot of your time trying to explain away the other issues yeah. that go against us. When you, when you start seeing the big truth as proclaimed and protected and preserved by the Catholic Church, what I have found in five years is I've yet to find a corner that I'm afraid to delve into. It gets mm -hmm. deeper and more wonderful. The, let me put it, uh, I recently had an experience where I was debating uh, a gentleman in Long Island, and uh, he was very upset about the issues of the Catholic anathemas. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Mr. James White, and whom I like. You know, we get along fine. You know, and I, we, our debates are on a friendly and gentlemanly uh, level, and, and we're, I think we're developing a friendship, and I, I really respect him. But, you know, he's always concerned. As, uh, and John Ankerberg, when I was on that show doing debates, he said, would you look at this? There's an anathema. If you don't accept what they say about the Pope, anathema sit. And if you don't accept what they say about the Eucharist, Mary, it's the Church, so on, anathema. And, you know, can you accept this anathema? And I said, so I asked the guy. What does anathema mean? And he said, well, you know, in, in, in St. Paul it means uh, you're cursed. I said, okay, words change over a couple thousand, you know, nuances change. What does the Catholic Church mean by that? And he, he said, no, I'm not so sure. Um, and so I said, it means that you're under a ban. You're excommunicated, that you can't share communion with us. You can't share in the other sacraments. doesn't mean that we've declared you're going to hell. We don't know that. Going to hell, that's a management question. God is management. I don't, I'm not in charge of sending anybody to hell. But I asked him then, do you believe the Catholics are Christians? And he said, well, if they deny a number of different doctrines, yes. And then I said, well, of course, I don't deny these doctrines, so I'm not Christian. That was part of the, the, the <laughs> dealing. I said, stop complaining about this, because you're saying I'm damned to hell. And we're not saying this with the anathema. That's one thing. But secondly, I noticed, and this was on our other topic, in that discussion, his point was, if you deny a number of Catholic doctrines, then you can be a Christian. And that was the key, mm. that he wanted to make Christianity smaller. Mm. You know, that we had to deny yeah. our love of the Blessed Mother 
and, and, and not just love her, but praying to her. Mm -hmm. And we had to deny that works are part of it, that Jesus our Lord in Matthew 6 verse 1 says that when you do your righteousness, don't do it before men so they can see, but before your Heavenly Father, who will reward you for it? And that doesn't fit in, and I'd have to deny that, or deny other texts, uh, you know, like Saint, uh, I always tell audiences, me my smart aleck self, that uh, <laughs> Uh, there's only one passage in the Bible that actually has the words be about being justified by faith alone. One text. And I say, where? Uh, James 2.24 with one more word. Not. <laughs> You're <laughs> right. not just. Not just. And, and so, but they have to ignore that. And as you well know, Luther yeah. had to remove James, Hebrews, 2 Peter, 2 John, 3 John, Jude and Revelation to they protect didn't fit. his position. Yeah, yeah. They didn't fit his, his sense. And I guess the, the, the sense that I have from converts is, is, is that they, they find more things fit. Mm -hmm. More mm -hmm. things fit. And along with that, I'm very gratified that people who convert from Judaism or mm -hmm. from uh, Protestantism never hate where they yeah. came from. If they said that wicked Babylon church of this denomination or that denomination, I would be very, very nervous and upset. I don't want them to hate the Presbyterian church, mm -hmm. the Anglican church, or the Baptist church, or Methodist church. While you're in the Catholic community, or if you've come out from another one of these churches, if you hate that, you're really not being a friend to the Catholic side mm -hmm. or to your own soul. I don't know where hate would fit in. That's right. <laughs> this is something that, you know, I, what I cherish is that when they convert, they so often love where they came from so much more mm. because they learn so many wonderful things. The love of the Bible that they have, mm. the love of good teaching of Scripture, the love of a good sermon, a mm. long one, but a good one. <laughs> and they <laughs> <laughs> Definitely long sometimes. You know, in fact, I've always wanted, since we began this program, is to ensure that that was the the attitude of this program yeah, itself, absolutely. that this is, uh, I am so thankful for the witness of my parents and the, and the yeah, churches absolutely. and the seminary where I went with yeah. Scott and, and the gang, and the, how they helped us, first of all, brought us to Jesus Christ and right. uh, helped us look for a love of the scripture. And it was because of that, that I wanted to be open to the big picture that you're talking about. Right. It's not just the narrow perspective where there's this narrow perspective that is Baptist and this narrow perspective is Presbyterian. In this narrow perspective that some Methodists, we all believe in sola scriptura, yet we can't sit at the same table and agree on any of the issues. Yeah. Now those are, those are some of the issues we try to deal with in this program. And uh, we've already got some phone calls and yeah. emails. Yeah, right. let's, let's go on to one. They, they have to deal with what we're talking about anyway. Let's take the phone call right now. Hello, what's your name and what's your question for us tonight? Hi, Marcus. Hello. Um, my name is Susan and I'm calling from Washington, D.C. Welcome. What's your question for um, us? You do a lot of debates, um, I think probably especially Father Mitch, and um, do you think those are really constructive? Thank you. Question. Uh, do you do debates? Well, not yet. Not uh, yet. Okay. <laughs> Just with my, you know, my wife and I, I debate once in a while. That's not a debate. In the <laughs> uh, Yeah, I do a lot of debates. Um, for one reason, uh, I'm more of a brat than Marcus is, <laughs> and uh, fits in my own personality, and you know, not. You know, I, and I'm not a, 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 a slam dunk type of debater. Uh, you got to win at all costs. That's just ridiculous. But I do think that they do a lot of good yeah. for a couple of reasons. A, it makes me do some homework. You know, what are the questions that other people are asking? And I have to look up what the answers are. A second uh, important thing besides helping me and clarify my own thought, uh, as a matter of fact, I had a roommate in grad school who had left the faith and you know went to a non-denominational denomination and he uh and he was very, he really uh was scared not to be catholic they, they had frightened him mm -hmm. about being catholic it's not that he loved them so much so he did but he really was scared to be catholic <laughs> and he and i would debate a lot and that i taught learned a lot from it so that's good but the other thing is a lot of people out there think that catholics don't have an answer to the criticisms of the faith. And, you know, some people have suggested, are you tilting at windmills? I don't think so. Uh, I, I think that it is important to let people know respectfully 
and from the text of the scriptures, the, how much we love the scriptures, that we base what we believe on the Bible, and that we do have answers for this. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe you won't accept these answers. That's something else. And I might not convince the person I'm debating, but they will also see that we have a, a response. And then let me give a, a, a response from a, a couple of people who have watched the debates. Uh, one a revert, one a convert. Um, a good friend of mine uh, who I debated was Walter Martin. Mm. You probably knew of him. Mm -hmm. um, Walter Martin was considered the top um, apologist in the Baptist Church, fighting against the cults, yes. the occult. He dealt with Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, mm -hmm. all, and he came up with really uh, very good research, mm -hmm. knowing what they what they did. And he, he he was somebody who was fun to debate because a he respected us Catholics, and he definitely was someone who said, you know, to me, you know, with, and, and on the radio when we were together, that he recognized that Catholics are Christians. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to disagree on a lot of issues, but he did not deny that we're Christians. Mm -hmm and that he, he and I prayed together before we debated. And we had a warm friendship. And uh, when he passed away, let's see, it's eight years ago, almost mm -hmm. nine, years, nine years ago now, um, his wife called all over the country to track me down to make sure that I got to the funeral, which I was you know, saddened to do, but glad to be there right behind his family. But Walter, you know, was debating me. And um, uh, somebody I hope you have someday, Tim Staples. Mm -hmm, yes. uh, Tim watched the debate. He brought one of his buddies from the Navy to watch the debate and didn't invite him back because he saw this Catholic is holding his own in a debate. And that, again, that was for him a revelation. Yeah. Catholics can hold this their own. But at times, as he noticed, as he watched the tape, they were not answering back or they were cutting out part of my answer and things like that. And he watched the tape seven times. He bought the tape, watched them seven times. And now he's a Catholic. And the rest of his Catholic family is Catholic. His brother's a priest. Mm -hmm. And they're doing wonderfully well. It, Whereas, can I tell you one more story yes, about yes. The, the Walter, too? Um, there's this one fellow, Scott Butler, whom you know. Right. He, he and a couple other men have written a book called uh, Jesus, book. Peter, and the Powerful Keys. Book. Powerful yeah. book. Scott had left the church, became a Protestant minister. And he came to some of my lectures in San Diego about 15 years ago. And this guy just wouldn't leave me alone. <laughs> and, you know, I, he'd come, I'd, I had a practice of studying in the afternoon. I'd go for a swim in the, uh, uh, study in the morning, swim in the afternoon, lecture at night. Well, I'd get out of the water from the beach in San Diego. He'd be at the, my blanket. <laughs> that, All right, now, prove me purgatory. Which, you know, he, he, <laughs> he just was just, he'd just really get, go at it. And this went on for a couple months. But then I said, look, Scott, I can't be at the beach tomorrow. I have to go have lunch with Walter Martin. He invited me up, and I'm going to go to this. And, and you know this guy. I said, oh, can I go? Can I go? <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Uh, the bathroom's out there. The, uh, <laughs> you know, the, uh, and I said, I'll ask. And sure enough, Walter welcomed him. Well, Walter and I were sparring back and forth, you know, as we did. But what Scott noticed is that Walter didn't answer any of the objections mm. we brought, any of the defenses. Walter had no answer again and again and yeah. again. And it broke Scott's heart. But he also said, I have to come home. Mm -hmm. You know, that I, I, yeah. I'm coming back to the Catholic faith. So in some of these cases, not only do you see that, you know, the Catholics get to present their position, but in his case, he saw that Walter couldn't answer it and he wanted to come back to the Catholic faith. It was the biggest surprise for so many of our non Catholic brothers and sisters that they, they don't think that Catholics can defend. Yeah. Church. And sadly, there are many Catholics mm. that don't know their faith well enough to defend it. And we've got to remind our listeners that Scripture says that we're always to be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. That's in 1 Peter. Uh, and that's 3, verse 15. Yes, and the rest of that, though, says, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Absolutely. Absolutely. We are not to use truth as a cudgel, it's with charity. Absolutely. And, and remember, you know, the big issue in that is, we don't convert anybody. I don't convert anybody. That is not my job. Again, conversion is management. God is management. That's right. I don't have the grace. I, all I can do is present a reason and to do so with respect for the other person's conscience. Mm -hmm. You know, that they, they, they have to look at the evidence and understand it. They can disagree. You know, that's fine. And I can't make them agree. 
And I can't make them have faith, but I can at least present the reasons to be. We're seed planters. Yeah, that's what we are. Let's take a quick email. This one gets us into the area which was uh, associated with your first book on the New Age. Father Mitch, you spent a lot of time regarding the New Age problem. What do you think is the most serious problem in the church today? Today, um, things are changing since I wrote my book hmm. on the New Age. Um, there are, I think that the New Age influence is decreasing inside the church because a lot of you lay people out there who are watching these shows, Johnette's show, mm -hmm. the shows I did, the books and other things that are available now that weren't, you know, 10 years ago, are really suspicious of anything that's New Age. Mm -hmm. And you call people on it. And that is something that I'm, I'm very, very, you know, delighted to see. Um, the Enneagram is still very big. That's still, that's one of the last vestiges of New Age stuff that's going on. It's always disturbing to me when I visit a retreat center and see so many books on that just tucked I away. I almost wonder if they intend them to be there or they just oh, yeah. forgot to clear their library no, shelves. No, 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 no. They, they like them. Uh, and, and for some retreat houses, it's still a staple. Mm -hmm. And where I get concerned especially is that so often that takes the place of Christ. You know, that they'll focus on our personalities and they won't talk uh. about Jesus. But I think that is where it gets me to where I think the real problem is. While the Enneagram is still around a lot, um, the bigger problem is that people are not taking the divinity and the sal salvific action of Christ seriously enough. Christ has become, for too many, a nice guy, too many Catholics. Um, he's uh, a good model, a good role model for you. He loves everybody. He wants you to love everybody, and he's a role model. But as I've been saying in different lectures around the country, people treat sin against God as if it were stealing paper clips from IBM. No big, they'll never miss it. God, you know, he's so big. He'll, does he care about what I do? And look, everybody's stealing paper clips. No, they don't miss it. They plan on it. Everybody's committing sexual sin. Everybody is stealing a little bit. Everybody's being a little bit lazy and irresponsible to their employees and employers. So, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're looking for a group plan to go to heaven. It doesn't I was work say that, that way. That idea, what you just said, it's so true, is not just at the lower levels of us laity. I mean, that's crept into the higher levels of moral theological theologians and philosophers. And the problem with it is, if you don't have a sense the, of, of the seriousness of sin, mm -hmm. that it's not stealing paper clips from IBM that they won't notice, but rather sin is against God who is all majestic and all good and all holy. And it, it's more serious because it's against somebody so good. Mm -hmm. It's like slapping your grandmother in the face. Mm -hmm. What a horrendous thing that would be. So also is sin against God. Mm -hmm. And because we don't understand its seriousness, we don't understand the seriousness of Christ's redemption that it's God who died on a cross unjustly. It's God whose blood is shed for us. It's God who redeems us by becoming man. And as, a, as God become man, he takes away these sins. This is serious. And it's not just you know, Easter waving banners. I mean, he's raised from the dead and offers us the hope of eternal life without seeing the seriousness of who Christ is. We miss out on understanding the seriousness of sin and the seriousness of the hope that we have as opposed to the despair offered by our culture. Sometimes we can get focused on the non-essentials as if they're essential and miss the essential yeah. as a non-essential. That's yeah, what that's I think is the biggest problem in Catholicism now. It's yeah. what I call crypto-Pelagianism. Let's come back. We'll take a break. Let's, I want to talk about that as soon as we come back. Okay. okay. Please stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment to visit with Father Mitch Paqua on these issues that so influence people who stay into the church or sometimes are drawn out. Thank you. Welcome back to The Journey Home. We're visiting this evening with Father Mitch Pacwa, 
talking about some of the issues of conversion and also in some of the experiences that he's had in helping so many come back to the church. Just before the break, you dropped a biggie on us <laughs> with a term called cryptopelagianism. Yeah. Is that a disease you might catch? Or maybe? Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, okay. Yes, it well, why don't you describe the reality right. of that? Pelagianism is the doctrine that there is no original sin and that you can save yourself. It was taught by a priest named Pelagius who lived at the same time as St. Augustine. And St. Augustine was on him like you know, no, he a was, dog on a bone. And he was a Catholic priest. Oh, yes, Catholic priest, I think from Ireland or England. Okay. And, uh, uh, you know, Matthew Fox, you know, used to, said you stop, people should stop picking on Pelagius. He was just a poor Irish priest. Well, he was wrong. We don't care where he came from. He was wrong. Uh, and you don't save yourself. There is original sin. Yeah. And there's actual sin. And the idea that you can, you know, pull yourself up by your own spiritual bootstraps is what Pelagius taught. Well, crypto-Pelagianism, it means that it, it's, it's kind of hidden, Pelagianism. In other words, people would probably not want to say that outright, that they're Pelagians, because it's a heresy. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes the way they believe and act is as if they're saving themselves. Mm -hmm. And they're not trusting in the grace of Christ. Mm -hmm. They're not coming to the cross. They're not coming to the empty tomb and, and having a sense of how radically important this is. Jesus is not the same as Buddha. There, and that, but that's various effects of it. People will say, well, really, Christianity is just one more spoke in the wheel, and it all goes to the same center, uh -huh. and it's so beautiful. Well, not really, because, for instance, Muhammad was a radical agnostic. He didn't deny the existence of God, but he said you can't say there is a God. Now, that's mm. not the same as Jesus, mm. who is radically in love with God because God is his Father. That's a radical difference. Mm. And it's not just another nice guy teaching something really sweet. You know, it, it, he's much more than a prophet. He's a redeemer, too. This, this confusion that is in the church and mm. not just outside the church. Uh, you know, as a convert coming into the church, in many ways, the way many of us came in was through reading the teaching, reading the primary sources, mm -hmm. reading the early church fathers, and we, and we see the truth of this church, and mm -hmm. we come in with great joy, and we come in thinking that we're going to encounter this great monolithic church, solidified in all these things that we, we read about the church's teaching, and then we come in, and we see a real church. And on the one hand, we end up with the conclusion, which I think is a true conclusion, this is the true church established by Christ and the apostles. But it's not the perfect church. That's for and sure. And it's not perfect because you and I are in it, right? I was going to say, any <laughs> church that lets me in it <laughs> there can't we be are. perfect. Yeah. In fact, in some sense, that's the best way that I see describing the whole Protestant experiment. It's the search for the perfect church, uh -huh, uh -huh. trying to find the perfect church of if I don't like what here, I'm going to go start the perfect church so here. So looking for God in all the right places. Right. And and what we have found in coming in is sometimes the discouragement of people that, Catholics that don't know their faith that well. Like we read the statistic. Yeah. They estimate, right, 80% of Catholics don't believe in the real presence. That's real disturbing. Yeah, well, see, first of all, when, with that statistic, Father Fessio was on the live show with me once, and he went through that. And part of the problem with that statistic is that um, they worded it yeah, too wonder. technically. And they, so that, they were trying to get Catholics to distinguish between a statement that uh, referred to impanation versus transubstantiation. Oh. You know, and uh, in other words, the impanation means that it's still bread, that the substance of bread is there, but Jesus comes into, uh, into the bread, but it still stays bread. They actually Tran used that question? Th that's how they worded it. And, and, and so it was too technical. And people said, yeah, Jesus is in the bread. You know, now, that's not correct. That's not a correct formula the bread becomes the body of Christ. And so you, yeah. to say that Jesus is in the bread is a false statement. So you don't want to do that. But um, it, it was just too technical for most folks. And I, I'd have to say, um, since about 1969, uh, catechesis in the Catholic Church has really declined. You know, we were afraid that nobody would pay attention to us. We were afraid that we had to follow the cultural trends. Mm. And so we were doing, relevant, uh, yeah, relevant. Re relevant was the, the, the word to which we bowed. And only young people could be re relevant. And uh, this, and I can remember that. 
you know, uh, not really thinking I'd ever get to be old uh, and irrelevant. Um, and, and certainly not finding out that now that I'm getting closer to the end of my 40s, you know, 48 now, get moving close enough to 49, I've loved my 40s way more than my 30s, which I, lo I love the 30s more than my <laughs> 20s, and the 20s were way better than my teens. <laughs> you know, I mean, getting old has been a blast. Yeah. I love it. Um, but we didn't think that in those days. Mm -hmm. This is, the, you know, once you, you get to be young once, and then after that it's all downhill. What a stupid it, idea It's that amazing is. how the, the uh, desire to be relevant has led to so much irrelevancy. You know? Well, see, it, that I, was it. Now, where are all the burlap and felt banners today? <laughs> You know, they're, they're gone. Uh, where, where have all, yeah. th to, to paraphrase an old song, <laughs> where have all the collages gone? <laughs> you uh, know, long ago. You know, I, think about, <laughs> I think about that text in Proverbs that says, <laughs> I was just thinking about how we used to use Simon and Garfunkel at Mass. You know, it was so relevant. Bridge over troubled waters. Uh, oh, it's so beautiful. It's embarrassing. Uh, it is. That it stuff. is. It's so uh, dumb well, as a box know, of rocks. Maybe we better, in our embarrassment, turn to a phone caller who yeah. might bring us back to relevance. <laughs> true relevancy. Hello, what's your name and what's your question for us this evening? Hello, this is Mary Higgins from Massachusetts. Hello, Mary. And I would like to ask, how can I avoid frustration in developing my spiritual life? Well, that's a unique, uh, very... I don't think you can. Well, I was going to say that <laughs> that was uniquely titled to your new book, too, yeah, The Issue yeah, of yeah. Frustration. Right, right. But I think what I think it's a good question when yeah. you pose it. So it it's, uh, uh, but I would s stick with it. You know, I wrote a book, Father, Forgive Me For I'm Frustrated. Um, I don't know that you can avoid frustration in your prayer life. Um, I wish the caller had stayed on because it would be important to know where the frustrations are from. There are a variety of sources of frustration. Isn't, in fact, frustration can be a pure sign Absolutely. of good prayer life. Exactly. Yeah. Because, you know, on one hand, our Lord, you know, will be sometimes frustrating. You might not find a lot of peace and joy in your prayer, as there were many periods in my life when I didn't, because the Lord was, in one sense, using His absence to motivate me to repent. Mm -hmm. And I could have gone and said, well, the heck with it all. I could, you know, just chuck the whole thing, forget it, I'm out of here. Or I can realize, you know, from, because of earlier experiences of real joy in prayer, that maybe He's trying to teach me something, and that that frustration with absence of God and, and dryness in my prayer was a call to repent. That's how I got out of the New Age movement. And, but on the other hand, there, there are also uh, frustrations that come because we need to mature, and we might not be, I, I oftentimes see, we might not be ready to mature, but we need to. Um, it's like a little kid who is learning to walk. And when you teach me, you know, my mom had a baby when I was uh, 13, and that was so much fun because I helped to raise them. And, you know, teaching them how to walk, where you, you, you hold, the, their, their little hands hold your fingers, and, and you walk with their hands above their head, and you walk them down the, the side of the um, s carpet. But then at a certain point, I would take my hands away from his, and he'd, <gasps> and then take a step, just one, and I'd yeah. catch him. You know, and a lot of times, and then I would do that to so take two steps and three, you know, so that he could learn to walk. And he, and he loved it after, after he got over the first yeah. fear. Sometimes our frustrations come because the Lord is calling us from a less mature level of prayer to a more mature one yeah. uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, it might be that a certain devotion has you know, been very important to us, but we use that and want the feelings we had with that devotion instead of going deeper into praying with Scripture. Or we want to pray, we don't want to pray before the Blessed Sacrament. You know, I find that very important. You know, that um, I need to be with Jesus. And we're afraid to take that step of just sitting there with Christ before us in the Blessed Sacrament and lis listening to the mm -hmm. text of Scriptures. So there are a variety of reasons. And, you know, you have to pay attention to all that's going on in your prayer. prayer that so that to find out what the source of the frustration is and to trust that our Lord is oftentimes feels absent, but um, you know it might be because he's trying to get us to do something yeah. new. For instance, when I was reassigned to a uh, teach in a high school, and I, I did not want to go at all. I really didn't <laughs> like the idea. Uh, I felt like somebody had. I was on a tramp steamer, and in the middle of the night, somebody had thrown me overboard, 
And oh. I couldn't tell if land was five feet to my right or a hundred miles to my left, and I just couldn't be able to know. Mm. And the only single point of light was that God had called me to be a Jesuit. Mm. And in that frustration of not, not knowing where to go, I could say, look, you've given me that one light. I have to stay with that, be faithful to my vocation. And then as time went on, it ended up being a very, very joyful thing. Well, and, uh, we're going to go to the email here, which deals with this next issue of the Scriptures. But I'm thinking about that whole wonderful book of the Scriptures. And in the midst of that, there is the book of Job that talks about the different aspect of the spiritual life, the struggles we can go through. All right. We recognize that. And often, you know, I think in my own life, and again, some of the teachings of St. John of the Cross and Teresa, they recognize that sometimes we're blind to some of the areas of detachment that we have to recognize. And the only way we'll ever get to that stage is for the Lord to allow us to feel far from Him so that we can, can focus on the needs. But, but also sometimes we need a spiritual director to help us see, yeah, to not be yeah. just stuck on our own trying to figure out right. what this frustration comes. We need someone. Maybe let's go to the email because of the time factor. Um, Father Mitch, you have studied the Bible a great deal. Which book do you find most profound? Which one do you enjoy the most, and why? Lewis from St. Louis. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. That's a tough one. The one I find most profound. Uh, I don't know. I uh, I love the gospel, you know, mm -hmm. for profundity. Um, I pray the Psalms a lot too. Uh, I, I'd say that the Gospels and the Psalms would be the, the most important. But you know, you know. I don't know that I can decide on most yeah. profound. It's, it's rough. I was thinking in terms of the audience yeah. here, many of which I'm assuming are Catholic, and many of us probably haven't got into the study of Scripture yet. Yeah. And I think part of the reason is for fear of, hey, if I read the Scriptures, I'll become Protestant. <laughs> you know. And I mentioned earlier that I wanted to bring up this issue where how absurd sola scriptura can be, because when you look at the Old Testament, yeah. if you just, this is all I've got. And you look at some of those things, you can really get yourself out in left field somewhere sure, trying sure. to figure out you need an interpreter. I'm thinking about the 13th chapter of Deuteronomy, you know, where it deals with what do you do with people that start pulling you away from the faith? Kill them. Well, right. Kill okay. them. Don't well, even touch them when they kill them. Just stone them. In yep. a soul of scripture as such, why do we not do that? Right, right, right. We need an authority that could balance how we yeah, understand yeah. Scripture or, apply in our life. You know, if uh, in our Lord's teaching that if something causes you to s uh, sin, cut it off. Well, you know, the church really does give us a little bit of a way to interpret that because, yeah. you know, most of us would walk around without many limbs. <laughs> yeah. Going with this maybe, in this issue of so many of our audience, we need to encourage them to open the Bible. Yeah. To not be afraid. First of all, let where me should they begin? Well, I mean, first, let me give a Catholic, you know, motive. There's an indulgence for reading that's scripture. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and that you know that the Catholic Bibles have had printed in there that there's an indulgence. You know, I don't know how long. Yeah. And this idea that uh, you know, I, I saw somebody sent me a, a email saying that well, didn't the Catholic Church put the Bible on the index? You know, forbidden books. And and you know, what it did is it said that. Uh, some of the modern translations into the vernacular were put on the index yeah. because people were abusing the translation. The, the Jehovah Witnesses mm -hmm. New World Translation is a complete abuse. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, you, of course we should condemn that, mm -hmm. but it's not the Bible we condemn, it's just some faulty translations. Sure. The Catholic Church has been consistent and constant in teaching that you need to read Scripture. Uh, St. Jerome had said it and the popes have continued to repeat it. Ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. Mm -hmm. In his preface to uh, the uh, book of uh, Isaiah, when, which he translated. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we need to have, is, is knowledge of Scripture so we can have knowledge of Christ. And I, to start, there are a couple ways to do it. Uh, I think for the first time reader, I would probably begin with the New Testament. Just start reading through, uh, especially the Gospel of John and uh, Luke and Mark. You might, a lot, some people say to save Matthew to last because sometimes it's hard for them. But read through the Gospels. Read through, through the Epistles. Go through the whole New Testament. And as a matter of fact, if you do four chapters a day, you can go through the whole Bible in a year, Old and New Testament. Mm -hmm. Then uh, one of the seminarians, I, I, when I was a novice, I started this as a practice, reading the whole Bible every year. 
And I would just start at the beginning and go all the way through. Well, now I do it in Hebrew and Greek, you know, so I can show up. <laughs> we won't recommend our audience start there. Why know, not? Hebrew and Greek. Yeah, okay. Just learn Hebrew and Greek. <laughs> but if they're going to if they're going to stay with English, start off and, and, and just go through. Gen and if you see long lists of, of names, skim through it. Actually, I find those interesting in a way. But for the first time reader, yeah, it's just sort of it's skim through that picture. and keep reading through. Mm -hmm. That that marvelous, marvelous thing that Jeff Cavins yes. and Scott Hahn have done, right. you know, on going through the through the Bible. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I strongly recommend it. We've done that here on the air or at EWTN and I strongly recommend that you use their system. But go through the text. And read. Someone's hitting us with an email. Why don't we grab this order that sure. we have a little bit of time left? It's about confession. Uh, when you hear confessions, should the person be very precise or speak in more general terms? I mean, just how detailed should I be? If I don't discuss all the details, is it valid? Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's, virtue stands in the middle way. Um, I don't need, as a confessor, I don't need to know all the details. I don't want to know all the details. What I do need to know, and what's good for the person to do, is mention the number of sins and the kind of sin. All right? So that... Um, and then a after I punched him the first time and then I blooded his nose the second time and then I just started ripping his eyes out. No, he got into a deadly fight. That's all I need to know. I don't need to know, uh, you know, because then it moves from confessing to bragging. We don't want, <laughs> we don't want that. Yeah. Um, in, uh, and this is, in, uh, say with stealing, you should say how much you stole from the from the person you stole. It does make a difference. If you stole a hundred dollars from some, you know, guy who lives on the, in a cardboard box on the street, that is much more serious than stealing $100 from IBM. Now, that it, there is a difference in the, the gravity of the sin because you stole this guy's livelihood for probably a week or two versus $100 from IBM is serious, but it's not going to, you know, the, the stock market's not going to hear about that. Um, so, and the issue there is how can you do retribution? You know, you have to pay back the people whom you, whom you, you steal. That's very important. Uh, so that's why you need to know the number and the kind uh, so to have us help you, too. Also, with number and kind, some sins, you know, might happen once in your life versus something that's a pattern. If it's a pattern of sin that, you know, for, you know every day for the last, you know, uh, five years, I've gambled away all of my earnings and I'm starving to death. That's a serious problem. It's more than just the sin yeah. of gambling your money away, but you need some help. Mm -hmm. So that's also where the priest can maybe help, you know, offer some spiritual counsel as well. Mm -hmm. The main point is not the spiritual counsel as such, it's the forgiveness of the sins, but it's important to know the number and the kind so that we know that uh, if it's a mortal sin, a venial sin, how serious this is. Maybe in our closing couple moments, uh, how about a word of encouragement or advice to those in our audience who have either lost friends or family who've left I mean left the church in that sense have lost them outside the church or those who have left the church who are outside who may be seeking to to reconcile with the church yeah. any thoughts of encouragement yeah um do you have a minute or so yeah by okay. minute um my father had stopped practicing our faith for years he had argued with me once when I was 12. He didn't want me to be a priest. He said to me, why don't you be a doctor? If you're a doctor, you can still help people. You don't have to be a priest to help people. I told him, Dad, if I'm a doctor, people get healed, that's good. But later on, they're going to die anyway. Mm -hmm. If I hear somebody's confession on their death, that they go to heaven, that lasts forever. It's a better deal. <laughs> he was a car salesman. <laughs> and I prayed for him and prayed for him for years. And as many, I talk about it in my book, you know, my parents' divorce, and you know, it was very difficult. But I really trust in the power of prayer. A month before my mother died, the two of them were reconciled on her deathbed. She had cancer. When he was had his final illness, he, he um, had heart problems and was in, in for surgery. I survived the surgery, but not for real long. But he said, I want to go to confession. And I told him, you know, Dad, I'll get you another priest if you want. He said, no, I'll go to you. So that something I had said to him when I was 12 years old, 33 years later, you know, affected him that he got to hear conf have his confession heard. I'm strong. I, I, I prayed for him for years, and it wasn't the way I thought it would go, and that's not up to me. Mm -hmm. But you know, I trusted that those are answers to prayers. 
I know of people, you know, who pray for others, and sometimes it happens on their deathbed. Sometimes before, you never know. But don't stop praying for them. And when they're ready, give them a reason to believe, as St. Peter tells us. Father Mitch, thank you so much. My what a great pleasure. privilege to have you on thank the show. You. I look thank forward you. to it so much. And again, thank you for your constant work and witness, even those, those debates when you put yourself on the, on the line to defend mm, the church. Fun. Thank you for your witness and your charity. Thank you. Please stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment for some final words for the journey home. Welcome back to The Journey Home. We've been visiting this evening with Father Mitch Pacwa as he's shared with us a variety of insights from his own work with converts, his own teaching on this network, his writings and other things that have been an encouragement to so many of us. And I thought in reflection on some of the things he's told us this evening that I'd end with a couple of quotes from the, second, uh, the fourth chapter of Philippians, some verses that I find so encouraging for the journey. <clears throat> He begins by reminding us to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He's got to repeat it because we can become so discouraged if we look out and all the stuff and the voices that are around us to rejoice because of the great graces that our God has given us. He goes on to say, not that I complain of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. That's our call as we follow Christ. Sometimes, as one of our callers mentioned, we can become frustrated but we are to learn to be content because everything we have is a gift of God. Even sometimes the dry periods are there to help us grow in our faith. In verse 13, he says, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. God is the strength behind us. Everything we can do or have or will be able to accomplish is a gift of his grace and his strength. And then later he says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Our God is a great giver. When I think about this journey home that we are all on as we seek to follow Jesus Christ, we remember that we are not there by anything that we've done. We're on the journey and we will attain the end of our journey by His grace. All gifts come from God. Our calling as Catholics, as Christians, is not to be focusing on the gifts, but on this great giver that has provided His love for us that has drawn us to his son, Jesus, who has died and resurrected, that we might live with him forever. Thank you for joining us on the journey home. Look forward to being with you again. Hey, you're in our prayers. And keep the network in your prayers so that we can continue proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you. And may the Lord be with you until we gather again.